Hey everyone, what is up and welcome back to the Lifestyle Lifters show. So following up from last week's episode, which was Eat Smarter, the ultimate nutrition guide for fat loss. Today's episode is going to be geared around Train Harder, the ultimate fat loss training guide. And I'm going to dive straight into it. So when it comes to nutrition, if you remember back to last week's episode, the very first thing that I spoke about, which is most important, is adherence. In other words, being able to follow it. And the same thing is true with training. The best plan on paper is only as good as your ability to follow it. And I'll tell you a story about this, <clears throat> excuse me, just to paint the picture through. I had a consultation call with a girl before, let's just call her Siobhan. And she would have previously been working with a coach before, and she got the best results ever inside 12 weeks. You know, she was saying that she got built her leanest ever physique, she got the best results ever, and she was really, really happy with it. But as I mentioned in last week's episode, just always question the approach and ask, what did that client or what did they have to do in order to get those results? And that is what I asked her, you know, how, how did you find it, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I never badmouth any trainer. I don't ask who you were training with. I just asked about the approach itself. And the approach that she was following, it was unsustainable because she was doing six strength sessions and four cardio sessions a week. And this girl, she was an accountant, all right, already working 40, 50 hours a week and probably training for an excess of, you know, 10 hours plus a week. And she got the best results possible in 12 weeks. But as we were having our conversation there, whatever it was, a couple of months after finishing up, she regained the weight and put on some again. And her, the worst thing about this was she'd been so mentally scared from just getting down to that lean physique and having to work so hard that mentally it just screwed with her when she saw the weight pile back on again and that she looked like she did previously. She did not want to go back down to that dark place again because she felt that in order for her to get down to that gold body fat, let's just say it was 15%, she would have to do six more strength and four more cardio sessions per week. So what she was considering was doing something like liposuction, <laughs> which, I mean, she was the first person who mentioned it to me. I've actually heard a few other people mention to me since, but it just goes to show that whatever approach you were following, adherence and sustainability is the first thing when it comes to actually training harder for fat loss. So that is why whenever I have a consultation call with any new potential client, I always ask them, how many times a week can you 100% commit to? And, you know, as a coach, you learn over time. Some people might kind of say, you know, because the motivation is high, I can definitely commit to six. And usually in those instances, what I say is, look, we'll start you out with four. And at the end of the first week or second week, if you want more, come to me and ask and we can absolutely pile on. But I would rather you start less and build up your confidence rather than say we're going to do six. And then you feel like a failure at the end of the first or second week when you only got four out of six, because four times a week is still absolutely phenomenal, as is three times a week. You know, so it all really depends on your adherence and how many times you are able to train 100 percent. OK, so once we have our adherence in place, then when it comes to training. The, the big rocks we got to address are the volume, the intensity, and the frequency. What do those fancy words mean? Volume is the number of reps times sets that you do. So optimally, if your goal is to build muscle, and again, this can vary so much. There's such a huge range here. But the research has shown anywhere from 10 to 20 working sets per muscle group. So on the low end, imagine you were imagine you were training upper body. You count the number of sets that you're doing for your chest. So you might do four sets on the bench press. You might do three sets on an incline dumbbell and you might do three sets of push ups to failure. Four, three, three. That would be 10 total working sets in your chest. That could be on the lower end and you can absolutely build muscle doing that. On the higher end, it could be you do that on a Monday and you do that again on a Thursday. And now you're doubling up the amount of reps and sets that you do. OK, but again, there's such individual variance here with this. Um, but in general, research has shown about 10 to 20 working sets per muscle group is optimal 
per takery for building muscle. Now, that is the number of sets. How many reps? Again, such an individual variance here. You can build muscle doing as little as three reps per set to as, as many as 30 reps. Okay, so if you train in that three to 30 rep range and you're doing 10 to 20 working sets per muscle group, you can absolutely build muscle. Okay, now I know this is a very, very broad approach, but, but that is true. That is true. Okay, so it's it's nice to have individual variants. Like you, feel, you see so many people now and, and their workout programs, everything is just, you know, three sets of 10. <laughs> and eight to 12 to build muscle well what if you do seven reps what if you do 13 reps can you not build muscle in those rep ranges and you absolutely can how i like to structure it out is so a lot of the members who i work with a big goal of theirs is they usually have two goals one is a physique goal which is probably the most common get to a certain body fat percentage get to a desired look um, you know, so look my best for the summer, look my best for a wedding or just look good in general, you know, get some visible abs or just feel confident with the top off. That's usually the physique goal. But then a lot of our members also have a performance based goal. And for someone might just be as simple as just feeling stronger in themselves, you know, maybe doing a cup, being able to bang out a couple of chin ups uh, for one guy, you know, get to 100 kilo bench press. Um, for someone else, you know, double or two and a half times X their body weight for deadlift, whatever it might be, that's a performance based goal. So what I like to do with our members is I like to kind of tie in the performance with the physique goals in the program. And I'll use a client, Darren, as a very good example, because he is someone who really does take pride in his appearance. He wants to look good. He wants to get that, you know, visible abs. He wants he's around 10 to 12 percent body fat. But he also takes a lot of pride in his lifts and his numbers, which a lot of our members do when they come to work with us. I always say, you know, track your numbers like you would track your weight. So for Darren, what we do is we do a combination of different rep ranges. Usually at the start of the program, the start of the workout, we will work in that three to five rep range. And we might be doing exercise like the compound lifts for the lower weights or for lower reps, but you're using a heavier weight. And that feeds the ego, but that will also feed your strength. And as I've shown, you can build muscle in as little as three reps um, per set. Okay, so we kind of start out with the lower rep ranges. And then as the training session progresses, we we pivot towards um, bigger and, and broader rep ranges. So let's just say, for example, it could be a deadlift, uh, four sets of three to five reps. Then we might transition to, we'll say, a chin up, and that could be, three sets of six to eight reps. Then you could do a barbell row and that could be three sets of eight to 10 reps. Do you see what I'm saying? Then it could be some face pulls and that could be um, two sets of 12 to 15 reps. And then you could finish with some biceps and you could do, you know, 50 total reps as fast as possible. That's what I sometimes like to do. Do that for time, do it for volume there. So a lot of different ways you can do it. That's generally how I like to program myself with, with for myself and for my clients. We, we train the compound lifts heavier with lower reps, okay? Because it's like freaking doing cardio. Um, I'll go on to that in a second. If you're doing like high reps of deadlifts or squats, for instance. And then as a session progresses, as fatigue kicks in, we actually reduce the intensity and we increase the number of reps and sets that you were doing. OK, because that is the first thing. So volume, intensity and frequency. Volume is the number of reps and sets you were doing. Now, intensity, as I spoke about there, that is the proximity you are training to failure. And the reason I like to start out and program with the bigger compound lifts at the start for a lower rep range is because the intensity and the concentration required to do those is much, much greater than say a small accessory lift like a bicep curl, okay? If you're doing a deadlift, you need to be fresh. You need to be concentrated. You know, you need to be actually concentrated on every single rep. And as you know, as fatigue kicks in during the workout, you don't want to be doing deadlifts in a fatigue stage, which is why, this is why I'm not a get, or this is why I'm not a fan of CrossFit for that reason. I mean, I can't think of a better way to injure yourself than doing deadlifts and deadlifts and deadlifts for reps for time, okay? 
So what we like to do is when it comes to proximity to failure, I will usually program the bigger compound lifts towards the start of the workout. And I would always say, leave one or two reps in reserve. Do not push those to absolute failure. You're always better off leaving a rep or two in reserve for the likes of your bench press, your squat, your barbell squats, your deadlifts, your overhead press. Just because they're so taxing on the body that you could push your deadlifts to failure, okay, and go to absolute failure. But then when it comes to actually adherence, what if you were meant to train four times a week and you weren't able to recover for that deadlift session for three days versus someone who left maybe one or two reps in the tank and you were able to show up again tomorrow and again the next day and again the next day. So just while there can be a time and a place for training them to failure, particularly if you're like more elite and you're, 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 you're preparing for a powerlifting meet, you might have a ramp up period there where you really have like an intensification block, but that's always followed by a deload. But for most people listening to this who are working professionals, we probably don't need to worry about that. And what I would say is just always leave a rep or two in reserve for the deadlifts. Um, I was doing, what was I doing? Yeah, I was doing squats yesterday and <clears throat> I was doing reps of in the four to five rep range. And I got a set of four, I got a set of five and I was aiming for a set of five again in my third set. And the fourth rep, it it was obviously as the bar speed decreases as the intensity increases. It felt a bit slow. And I know full well I would have had that fifth rep in me. But at the opportunity cost of potentially tweaking something, I just left the rep in the tank. Felt good, racked the bar. And today I, I definitely am feeling the, the effects of the leg session, but I'm not absolutely taxed. Okay. So intensity comes to the proximity to failure. And for the compound rips, compound lifts, and also actually how close you are to your one rep max. So for example, if you're if your one rep max in a bench press is 100 kilos, if you're training at 90%, that would be at 90 kilos. Okay. And again, that intensity, the percentage of your one rep max, the closer you are to the one rep max, the higher the intensity the lift is. Whereas the further away you are from the one rep max, the less intense, the less intense it is. And this is something people have a hard time figuring out. But let's just say, for example, if you were to do a bench press for in the eight to 12 rep range, that wouldn't be as taxing as doing bench pressing in the three to five rep range in terms of the load that you're lifting there. OK, so just be mindful of that as well. Intensity, how close you are to failure and what percentage you are at your one rep max. OK. So I don't recommend training your compounds to failure, as I mentioned, but for your accessory lifts, the lighter movements, the likes of your tricep pushdowns, your calf raises, your bicep curls, your face pulls, or even like, you know, dumbbell work, like a dumbbell chest press, a dumbbell row, we can absolutely push those to one, within one to two reps of failure. One to two reps in reserve is what I would say there. Um, because they're much safer to do, to push to failure, there's a less and reduced risk of injury pushing for the majority of those exercises, doing them to failure. And also they're not as taxing on your nervous system. They will not, you know, if I were to do bicep curls yesterday to absolute failure, I wouldn't be waking up this morning saying, God, I'm absolutely fried. You know, I did bicep curls to failure yesterday. I'm not able to train today. Unless you're highly detrained, you're probably going to be able to do something. But if it were a deadlift doing it the day before, that could be a different story. I remember once I did 170 kilos on the dead at the straight bar for eight reps. And my God, it was like doing cardio and the next in an excess of five reps there. And that shot me. I was shot after that. I wasn't able to do much for the rest of that session. And that sometimes happens with me. So again, it's just being mindful, not pushing your compounds to failure, but for your smaller, lighter lifts, you can push those hard from the get go. Okay. Finally, so um, volume intensity, the final thing is frequency. Frequency is how often you actually train a muscle part, a body part. So again, once you get 10 to 20 working sets per muscle group, how you balance that out, it's really context and, and individual dependent. But for most people, listen, this is just why I'm against these bodybuilding bro splits. Like you could get up to 20 working sets per chest on a Monday and absolutely fry yourself. But the thing you have to understand is, you know, as your muscle does fatigue, the intensity and the effort you're able to bring to that, to that session 
will decrease as a session prolongs. And that's why I'm not a big fan of bodybuilding bro splits. Like you're just, it's it's going to be very, very hard to bring a decent intensity and to say a chest workout where you're doing 15 or 20 total sets there in 90 minutes. As time kicks on, your intensity and your fatigue will kick in and that can have an impact on your performance. So what I would recommend instead of following a bodybuilding bro split where you do chest on a Monday, back in a, back in a Tuesday, shoulders on a Wednesday, legs on a Thursday, and arms on a Friday, repeat. I like to train each body part twice per week at least. And this could be, let's just say in a four-day split, it could be upper, lower, upper, lower. And then that way, it then at least you're cutting the volume in half. So let's just say your target number of rep or sets that you want to do for your chest. I'm just using chest to keep it, to keep it consistent here, was 16 sets per week. You could do eight sets in Monday session and eight sets on Thursday set session. That's much, much more manageable than doing 16 all in the one session. So frequency, how often you train each body part. I recommend training each body part about twice per week. Just from our members, that's what we, what we found where growth tends to be optimal. Now, if you really want to push it and you want to prioritize an area, you can absolutely go three times a week. Okay. That is sometimes what I would actually do, what I've actually been doing recently with my legs, just because they have been detrained for a while with my injury. So I train my glutes now three times a week. Um, I'll do some form of leg work on a Monday, some form of leg work on a Thursday. And then I would do a less taxing um, cardio slash conditioning leg work on a, on a Friday, the day after actually. But I just make sure that the, what I do on Thursday doesn't have a negative impact on Friday. So if you have a body part that is lagging, you can absolutely train it three times a week. But I would say for, for most people, um, two times is probably is probably enough. But if you really want to push it three times a week. All right. Now, um, <clears throat> next thing we're going to speak about. So we have our volume, we have our intensity, we have our frequency. When it comes to training, then we've got to talk about progression. And I mean, I've you, you see it all the time. You see the people in the gym who do the exact same workout for the exact same number of sets and reps using the exact same weight. And then they wonder why their progress has plateaued. Okay. They've plateaued because they've been doing the exact same thing over and over again, and they're expecting a different result. All right. So there is, there is a lot to be said for changing your program up. On the flip side though, you see the people who, whose workout is dependent on, what they saw on Instagram or what they saw on YouTube the day off or the day before. They see new exercise on Instagram, on YouTube, might try that out tomorrow, and they do that on Monday session. The following Monday, they do something completely different. Okay? So when it comes to progression, it's very, very hard to progress at something if you're not doing it consistently. However, at the, on the other end of the spectrum, if you're doing something for too long, Everything works, but nothing does work forever, all right? Which is why I usually like to change your clients' programs up every four weeks because it's long enough for them to get a training stimulus. But going back to the very first point, the most important thing is adherence. And I just found in the past that if I did a program with a client for, let's say, six weeks, they started getting a bit fed up of it after like the fifth week. Whereas I found in adherence to be much, much better when they have that variety every four weeks, okay? Now, what are some ways you can actually make progress in the gym? Most underrated way is just improve your technique. We've all done it before where, you know, you do like an incline dumbbell chest press. And let's just say you're aiming for 10 reps. And after seven, it really starts to slow down. Eight was a bit of a grinder. And then nine and 10 <laughs> looks like you're having a freaking seizure. All right. But you do bang it out just about that last rep it was an absolute grind but you, you locked out your arms at the top okay the following week you do the exact same weight let's just say 30 kilos on the incline dumbbell chest press and nine rep nine and ten are much much smoother there you've improved your technique that is a form of progression okay obviously then when it comes to making progress add in weight to the bar you know and to be fair the sense of achievement People outside the gym will not get this. But for anyone listening, you're obviously into your exercise and you're into training. You know that sense of satisfaction. Those 1.25 plates are freaking underrated. 
being able to add 1.25 kilos either side to your deadlift, to your squat, to your bench press, to anything at all. Or obviously, if it's even more, the more the better. But just that sense of accomplishment when you can add more weight to the bar and get the same number of reps you did previously. It's hard to beat that. Okay, so obviously adding weight to the bar is a form of progression. And then also just adding more sets and adding more reps, you know, including more volume. That's what I like to do with our clients' programs. That Let's just say, going back to the back squat, usually we'll say if, if that's at the start of the workout and we're doing three sets of five week one, three sets of five in week two. So week one, we might focus on just nailing down the technique. Week two, just optimizing that. Then week three, let's add some progress. We might go and set it three sets of five, four sets of five. Okay, so week three, we've added some volume. We've added an extra set there. And then week four, we might say, okay, I'm going to keep it at four sets of five. That's enough volume. But now we might try push the weight. All right, so a lot of ways you can progress there, but that's usually what I like to do with our clients. Um, increase the sets and, or, and or increase the reps. Um, for the reps similar with our members and program, what I like to do is usually just give rep ranges. Instead of saying we got to do five sets in the squat, I might say four sets of three to five or four sets of four to six. So once you're on the lower end of four and the higher end of six, because honestly, your performance in the gym can increase or decrease by as much as, I think the research has said, by as much as 30%. And even more, depending on your trainability that day. How well did you sleep the night before? How was your stress? How was your food? How was your, you know, how was everything the day before? All of these can have a big, big impact. So that is why I like to give rep ranges because some days you might be feeling it and you could be able to push for the higher rep range. Other days, just for whatever reason, lifestyle stress gets in the way, you might have to go for the lower rep range. But you don't feel like a failure, at least knowing you're, you still hit that rep range. All right? But there are just some ways you can actually progress. And it's really important you have some element of progression in your program, okay? you It doesn't have to be every single week you're making progress, but over a training block, we'll say you're doing a program for four weeks or for six weeks. Can you look back at the, at the start? And can you look back at the end and say, okay, I've definitely made progress in this lift. I've either increased the weight. I know my technique have, has improved. I'm be, I've been able to do more volume and recover from it. Or I was just able to get more work done in the same amount of time. You need to have some kind of data there knowing that you are progressing. Okay, that is really important. And for me, what I like to do with my own training is I have an Excel sheet here. And I can go back as far as 2018 and before it as to what training that I was doing. So I'll often wonder, what training was I doing when I ran the marathon? So I can actually go back and I have all the data there that I can feed off. This was what I was doing on Monday. This is what I was doing on Sunday. This is, this is how long the training took me. All right, this, these are the lifts that I was using. These are the numbers that I was hitting. So it's just a great way for you to have like a training log there. It's a nice way to hold yourself accountable to make sure you are making progress. Um, just what I use in with our, with our clients is they have access to the Mac Lifestyle Fitness app. So it's all there done out for them. And they can actually see their progress week by week and actually like just go off. Okay, last week I hit, I hit this number in the deadlift. So this week, I'm going to aim for at least starting out of that and maybe progress in there. But regardless, it's important you should track your progress and also have some element of progress built into your programming. Okay. So once we've decided on the progression, next thing in, when it comes to um, training harder for fat loss is actually exercise selection. And as we know, not every exercise is, is created equal. Okay. You, as I mentioned and alluded to earlier, doing a set of bicep curls to failure is going to be much, much less taxing on the body than doing a set of deadlifts to failure. Which is why I'm a big fan of doing compound lifts. And why are they called compound lifts? Compound is more than one. On compound lifts, they train more than one muscle group at a time. Okay, and people say like, for instance, deadlifts often get demonized and there is no one size fits all and no best or or there's no exercise you have to do. But when people say that deadlifts are a bad exercise for building your back, <laughs> I would really call them out on that. Just pound for pound, give me or name, a, name an exercise that trains more muscles at once. And I'll wait. 
Okay, so that is why I'm a big fan of compound lifts because you can train and get a lot of train a lot of muscle groups all in the one exercise. Okay, so when it comes to exercise selection, I usually recommend again, depending on the client, start now with compound lifts. Now, for some of our older members, um, I've one or two, I have a few clients actually in their, I would say their early 40s, and some in their some in their actually early 50s. And what I like to do there with some of them is I would actually now I sound like a bit of a I sound like I'm contradicting myself, but if I'm doing compound lifts with them, I mightn't actually do them at the start. I will wait for them to maybe do them towards the middle of the session when they're warmed up a bit more. Just because after some of them, the way they're moving, maybe their mobility, they actually feel better with a bit more blood flow. I sometimes actually get that way as well. That you know, I'm I, I might just do like some some would say sled work and then do some some deadlifts or some squats. But I find that extra bit of blood flow actually really helps me out when I'm doing my first work and set there. But in general, exercise selection, I would suggest starting out and building your program around the compound lifts and then tying in accessory movements around that. What are accessory movements? Accessory movements, the purpose of them are to build upon your compound lifts and train smaller lagging muscle groups. Okay, so going back to the first point there, imagine your main compound lift is a bench press. Well, then your accessory lift, what, what is a movement that I can do that can actually help me bring up and improve my bench press? So that could be something like a dumbbell chest press. Okay, that is going to indirectly impact and build upon your bench press because it's the same or similar movement pattern. Okay, for a deadlift, what are some exercises I can do that can build my deadlift? That could be something like an isometric deadlift, a pause deadlift. That could be a wide grip pull-up to build up your back. That could be a barbell row to build your back there. Okay, what are some exercises that could build my squat? So my squat is my main lift. That could be something like everyone's favorite, a rear foot elevated split squat to work in your quads, to work in your glutes there. That could be something like a single leg deadlift to work in your hamstrings, all right? So that's what you always think about. You start out with the compound lift and then build your program around that. What are some accessories you can do to improve that, okay? Once you've decided on your accessories, then you can add, so when it comes to fat loss particularly, I'm a big fan of hybrid training. And hybrid training is essentially where you combine a strength element to your program a muscle, ele muscle building element to your program, but also a cardio and conditioning element too. Kind of like being a jack of all trades and a master of none. And hybrid training is not the best fit for anyone who wants to get very, very good in one area. Like if you want to be an elite level uh, bodybuilder, hybrid training probably wouldn't be the best approach for you. Just like if you wanted to be a top end power lifter, hybrid training, again, probably wouldn't be the best fit. But for most of our clients who, as I said, they have a physique goal, get to a certain body fat percentage or body, or body weight, but also performance element too. They want to look good. They want to feel good. A lot of the time, I've never heard anyone say that they don't want to feel out of breath going up a flight of stairs or they don't, they don't want to be able to go for a hike on a Sunday without feeling absolutely scathed or they don't want to be able to go for a 5K run because their cardio is not in place there. So that is why I'm a big believer in hybrid training and for most of our members, what I will do is I will add some kind of a cardio or conditioning component towards the end of the workout. So on the high intensity side, this could be something like, we'll say a salt bike, 10 rounds of 10 seconds on, 20 seconds off. Takes five minutes. I did it yesterday and I was <laughs> grasping for air from the end of it. Okay, it could be something like that. For some of our members, what we like to do is interval runs in the treadmill. 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off for five to 10 minutes. Other other elements could be something like um, a conditioning, a circuit, okay? So sometimes what I like to do is like a kettlebell circuit where you do kettlebell swings, five or six kettlebell swings, five or six kettlebell goblet squats, five or, five or six, five to six kettlebell lateral lunges, and then five to six kettlebell um, windmills. And you do all of that without resting. So you go from one exercise into the, re into, into the, into the next without resting. A nice way to do some muscle building cardio is what I call it. So that's, that's, I will usually add that towards the end of a workout to see now how can we actually maintain and improve our technique and maintain that technique towards the end when we're getting tired. Can we keep our work output? Can we keep our effort relatively high there? So when it comes to fat loss, you can do some high intensity training. The downside of HIT is 
that it can be quite taxing on the body. The upside is it takes very little time to get a good effect on it. So I would also recommend, depending on the client, we might do some list, which is low intensity steady state. And I effectively, I like to just give our clients a step count. And this could be a range. It could be for some clients, depending on where they're at. Let's just aim for 8,000 a day. For others who are on the higher end, it might be 10 to 12 or 10 to 15. If they're already at like the 10K, I might say, let's try push for 12. But usually I would recommend that at a minimum for a client, at least 7.5K. All right. And that can be your cardio element there as well. Some of our members then, they like to go for 5K runs. So we can schedule those into their workouts so that they're not, you know, they might go for a run at the weekend and train in the gym during the week. Or they might go for a run on one of their quote unquote off days from the gym, like a steady state 5K. But in general, when it comes to exercise selection, try to start out, whatever your goal is, but if your goal is building strength or building muscle, probably start out with the compound lifts, then have some accessory movements built around that. And then towards the end of your workout, and what I like to do is add a cardio or condition component to it there. So hit training, list training, or just um like, as I mentioned, circuits or condition circuits there, they all tend to work well. But that is my side of training, hybrid training. I absolutely love it because I'd like to think that, look, I'm never going to be the strongest guy in the gym, but I'd have decent enough numbers that my strength is at a, you know, a pretty decent point. And also if someone asked me, okay, do you want to go for the gym? Do you want to go, do you want to go and lift? This guy, he lifts decent weights. But then if that same person said, or somebody else asked, do you want to go for a run? I'd be able to hold my own and would say a 5K or a 10K there. And that is what I kind of like the idea of, like just being, being, being hybrid, being balanced, not just, not just getting my exercise from one form of training, combining the multiple elements there. So I like being strong, but I also like being fit, being able to go for a run. And that is that is why I'm a big fan of hybrid training. All right. So we're coming close to the end. Next up then is rest periods um, when it comes to fat loss. And what I will say is, to be honest, training for fat loss and or training for strength gains or training for doing a lean bulk, very, very minimal difference there. For the fat loss, you actually might need to reduce the volume that you're doing because you're, you, you'll are you probably be in a calorie deficit and it might take you longer to recover. But very, very minimal difference in general between training for muscle gain and or training for, for uh, losing fat. But when it comes to uh, the next element then is going to be uh, rest periods. And as I mentioned before, the higher the intensity of the effort, the likes of a deadlift, even though if you're doing that for five reps, you would need to take a longer rest period for a five rep set in a deadlift Versus, we'll say, a 10 rep set on the chest press or a 15 rep set on the dumbbell bicep curl. Because the de deadlift, as I mentioned, it's more taxing on the body and you need more time to recover. All right. So for the compound lifts, you probably need anywhere from two to five minutes, depending on how advanced you are, to recover. I know two, five minutes might sound like a lot, but I'll tell you a story. I was doing a, a training certification course before with one of my all-time favorites, Joe DeFranco. And he was training an American footballer, an elite, elite athlete, as you can tell. And he was doing some 40 meter, 40 meter sprints with them, I believe it was. Yeah, I think it was 40 meter sprints because it was for the 40 yard dash that he was training. And he got the 40 meter sprint. No, sorry. It, I think it was sprinting for, we'll just say 100 meters inside around about 10 seconds. And after a 10 second sprint, his work to rest ratio was one to 72. He needed an over an eight minute rest before he was able to run that again because he was absolutely taxed. He was absolutely fried after just a 10 second sprint there. So the more advanced you are, listen to this, the longer your rest period you will need. One of my one of my friends as well, Paddy, he's he's a really, really elite um jumper and sprinter and i'd see that when i was playing when i used to play football i'd see that in him his output would be really really high for the first sprint but if he didn't get enough time to recover we'll say you know if he didn't get you know his, his three or four minutes to recover his second sprint his third sprint he wasn't able to maintain that same intensity all right so the the more advanced and the more technical the the exercise you're doing the longer the rest that you will actually need. 
Whereas the more reps you're doing in general, the lighter the rest you'll need. So as I mentioned, you might do a, a 10 rep set on bicep curls and I'd be, I'd be programming a rest period there of 60 to 90 seconds before we go again there. Because for that, you want time under tension. But for deadlifts, you want performance. For the accessory deadlifts in general, you want a bit more of a pump and you want time under tension and you don't actually even want full recovery if the goal is muscle growth. So um, again, rest periods will depend, but in general for the compound lifts, two to five minutes and for the accessory lifts, maybe a dumbbell chest press, it could be 90 seconds to two minutes. And then for the really lighter lifts, the likes of a calf raise, bicep curl, tricep pushdowns, you could push it for 60 to 90 seconds or even a bit less. All right. Um, what I also like to do just when it comes to rest periods, a lot of our members, they obviously they, they have a short amount of time in the gym for some of them, maybe like an hour. And I will try to pack it and get as much volume done in that hour as possible. So what I'm a big fan of as well is using supersets. And supersets, I'm a big fan of using pairing opposite muscle groups and, and, and supersetting them together. So for example, let's say you're doing a dumbbell chest press, an incline dumbbell chest press. I will often pair that with an incline dumbbell row because doing a dumbbell row, that will work your back primarily, whereas doing a chest press will naturally work your chest. And as your chest is recovering, you can absolutely train your back and it's going to have a very, very, very minimal, a minimal impact on your neck set on the chest, okay? So if you are someone who's caught for time, use supersets to your advantage, provided you know how to program them properly, okay? For example, I wouldn't superset doing deadlifts with then doing something like squats because that will 100% take away from your set of deadlifts there. But you could potentially superset for deadlifts. I generally don't like to actually add supersets, but we'll say for the smaller accessory lifts, absolutely add in supersets there. So another example could be you might do a chin up and you could do an overhead press. Okay, a vertical pull, pull movement and a vertical push movement. A lot of different ways you can do it. Okay, finally then, um, when it comes to training for actually fat loss and just getting the best results in the gym. So we've, we were able to adhere to four times a week. We know that we're getting about 10 to 20 working sets per muscle group. We are training at or close to failure for the accessory lifts, but we're leaving one or two reps in the tank for the compound lifts, okay? We're following a four time a week, upper, lower, upper, lower split. Technique, our progression wise, we have a plan to follow. We're trying to either increase the reps, improve our technique, increase the number of sets or reps that we're doing. For the exercise selection, we're usually starting out with the big compound lifts and then building our workout around that and finishing with some cardio or conditioning. For rest periods, we're resting longer for the compound lifts and we're, we are reducing the rest periods for the smaller accessory lifts. Finally, then it comes to actually tempo. And tempo is the pace or the speed at which you actually perform the lift at. What I, did, what I like to do with our programs for some for more advanced uh, lifters is I will do one, one set of program where we really focus on the lower. And this is called the eccentric. So let's just say a squat. Instead of just squatting down, we might do a three second lower. That is called, that is where we add tempo now. So squat for squat down for 1,001, 1,002, 1,003 and then explode up, okay? For the next phase of the program, we might add some tempo to the bottom part. This is called where you isometrically pause at the bottom. So we'll just say the squat. Phase one, we're, we're focused on squatting with a three second lowering. Phase two, we squat down as normal, but once we get to the bottom of the hole in the squat, we pause for a count of one. We, cause for, we pause for a count of two, we pause for a count of three, and then we explode up. That is called an isometric hold. OK, and then finally, for phase three, you might say, OK, now we just really want to go for speed here. And this is called concentric and concentric training. It's, it's really good for like power for athletes there where you just essentially focus on effort. And, and the cue I like to use is break the bar. So when you're squatting, you're going down and you're going up as fast as you possibly can. When you're deadlifting, you're going to try to pull that as fast as you can from the floor. When you were bench pressing, you're almost throwing the bar up to the ceiling as you're repping it out. That's a great way to just develop power and force. But it's a very, very underrated tool adding tempo to your lifts there. Um, you know, we've all seen, and I've, I've been victim of myself before, ego lifting, where you're kind of like swinging the hips and doing bicep curls. Not to say that they can't play a role, but instead of doing that, you could do is, you know, do a bicep curl where you lower the weight for a count of five, four, 
three, two, one, and up again, down for five, okay? That is a fast way to get a real pump and to get a great effect if, if the goal is muscle building. But that is the final thing just to consider there. I feel like we covered a lot here. The last thing I just will say is in terms of lifestyle integration, yes, um, with the nutrition on last week's episode, we spoke about getting the weekly food shop in, planning your meals out, potentially batch cooking. With the training, what I always say to our clients is treat it like a doctor's appointment. Okay, if you had a doctor's appointment at 1 p.m. on a Wednesday, you would show up and you would be able to get work off to do that. Treat your workouts the exact same freaking way because it's an appointment with yourself. It's an investment in your future self. So for most of our members who are working professionals, I usually recommend getting it done before work, before the chaos hits them. During lunch, if they have an hour there to spare, or on the way home from work. In other words, bring your gear with you to work and go on your commute home. Because what I've just found from my own experience and from clients in the past is, if they get home and they sit down and they get a bite to eat, for a lot of people, they can find it quite difficult to find the time and the motivation, the motivation in particular, to get up again and to go to the gym, which is why I recommend bringing the gym gear with them to work and going on the commute home, okay? Like I said, you want to decrease the resistance and make it as easy as possible to get your workout in. So pack your gear the night before. It's what I always do. Have my workout gear laid out the night before. Okay. And pack your gear bag if that is the case for you. And bring that with you to work if you're doing it after work. Okay. Also just, you know, join in a gym that's on your commute home so you don't have to go out of your way to actually go to a gym. Or having the option to train from home if you can't join a gym. All of these things, whatever it is you want to do with your workouts, make it as easy as possible. And just a bit of plan, a bit of preparation, it does go a long way. All right. So that is all for this week's episode on Train Harder, the ultimate fat loss training guide. I hope you got a lot of value from it. I put a lot of time and effort into these episodes. I prepare a lot for them. And in return, the only thing I would ask for is if you did get value from this, if you learned something, if you got something new, please share the show. Okay, I do not ask for money. If you want to send me money, you can if you learned a lot. But the, the fee is not monetary. It's just a value exchange. If you got value from the show, please share the show. Share with a family member. Share with a friend. Share with a work colleague. Go onto your Instagram stories and tag me at Mac Lifestyle Fitness that you, know, that you listen to the show, you got value from it. And I will repost it to my stories there as well if you want a shout out. But regardless, I would appreciate if you left a review and shared the show. That is how this podcast will grow. All right, that is all for this week's episode. So finally for next week on the three-part series for fat loss, I'm going to address more lifestyle. Okay, so like just managing stress, um, speaking about sleep and just some frequently asked questions we get when it comes to fat loss. In other words, can you lose fat and build muscle at the same time? Um, what is the best training split, et cetera, et cetera. I'll try to address all of those most commonly asked questions in next week's episode. But until then, I hope you got value from the show. And if you did, please share it and we will catch you guys. Lifestyle Lifters, episode number 58 next week for episode number 59. Take care.